This has taken four years as we broke up in four different series over the last four years going through all the different parables, and today marks the, uh, last week marked the final one of all of them, and this week is a a overview. I want to help you understand what to do and how to approach the parables going forward. Uh, seemingly at first service, I had a lot of people that seemed like they were really blessed by this, so uh, I pray that you can take notes. These nine points that I'm going to give to you shortly are not going to be in your bulletin. I didn't get it done in time enough for Bev, uh, but you can write them down. But We will also make them available online by Tuesday, okay? So if you want to be able to have this to help you in your learning, we'll make sure it's available for you. Most of us have read a parable at one time or another. Most of us have heard a parable told, maybe Sunday school, maybe just reading through the Bible, maybe somebody shared us, you know, with us one of them. And maybe we've understood it, but then, you know, as we start to kind of plug into our faith walk, we, want to, we wonder if we got the right interpretation. A lot of us have done that. That happens often, so, so do not fret if you might have not really completely comprehended exactly what, what it is you read. The original Greek word for parable is parabole, and it actually, it means a symbolic, fictitious narrative of common life that conveys a moral. Okay, well, in simpler language, there are stories with earth, about earthly things with a, that teach a spiritual lesson comparing two seemingly completely different things to get to the point. And as we early on stated this, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. For those who have never read the New Testament, uh, they may have heard some of the parables of Jesus. Like I said, the parables make up a, a crucial part of the Bible, so it's Im- imperative that we learn about them. Once you actually understand what one of them says, then what it does is it actually transforms the way you read the rest of the Bible. You begin to see... Uh, hyperbole brought into understanding. You begin to see symbolic wording brought into understanding. You begin to see the foreshadows, what we call the types and shadows. There's 12 tribes of Israel, right? 12 disciples. The foreshadow. (laughs) So there's tons of them in the Old Testament. And the more you learn, the more, technically 13, by the way. Well, more on that in another time. But, but what we do learn is that there's always a foreshadow. These are the things we learn. But when we, the, we study the parables, like something like the prodigal son, you know, the prodigal son decides that he wants all his inheritance, he re, leaves dad, and, and, he, and he's down on his luck, and he gets down to the point where he's ready to eat what the pigs are eating, the swine are eating out of the trough. He decides to go back home, and he doesn't know how his dad's going to welcome him, and his dad welcomes him with joy and loving arms. That's the prodigal son. That's found in Luke 15. And Jesus teaches us that the translation of this is the Lord receives those who stray from him, which is every one of us. We were all born into sin. Whether or not we were born in a Christian, raised in a Christian family, we were still born into sin. The regeneration, you're born again, you're, you know, your becoming a believer had to be a very individual, supernatural thing between you and God, and some of you haven't even got there yet. That's why we church. Maybe you heard the parable of the sower, where the, Jesus says that the, 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 the farmer takes the, um, the sower takes all these seeds and he throws them on, and there's four different soils, and so it basically shows you four different reactions. Some of the some of the plants, they kind of grow and they wither and die. Some of them are chucked out by the weeds immediately. Others do not take any root, but there's some that really take root and they grow and they sprout. That's a comparison to how people respond to the gospel. So it's taking an earthly metaphor and he's using a spiritual story to explain it. We all like examples. What do you say when you're not understanding something? Well, give me an example. Wow, wow, look at that. Yeah, we all like examples because Jesus used them to explain these supernatural, beautiful, spiritual stories to us. These parables often have a powerful message wrapped up in something that appears as simple. So today we're going to give you some help with this. I need you to pray with me first. Father God, thank you for bringing us together. As we close this parable study today, we pray, Lord, that this is practical, helpful information that can be given to everybody here so that they can better read the word 
going forward. They can sharpen their skill sets. So we ask you, Lord God, to open our ears to hear your message this morning and write your words upon our hearts as we humble all of ourselves before your throne. Whatever problems we have, may we lie them right there at the foot of your altar. Sickness, struggle, whatever the case may be, let us just learn from you now. I pray that I don't get in the way of your message going forward, that you would speak through me, this unworthy human vessel, to your children by way of the Holy Spirit, all for the glory of Yeshua, our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why did Jesus teach in parables? Well, this got asked by the disciples, and they asked him. Jesus gives a response, and his response was quite direct. So I'm going to give you his response. We're going to give you three points about the response before we go any further. Matthew 13, 11 through 13. Matthew 13, 11 through 13. It'll be on the screen, and it'll be available for you at home. Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him will be given, more will be given, and, who, and, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Jesus answers this, and it almost sounds like a parable in itself. <laughs> However, in today's world, evangelical Christian church, no matter what the denomination, how many of them do you think, read, well, whoever has to more will be given and he will have abundance and immediately apply that to possessions. It's crazy. But then what he says was, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. What does that mean? because they're poor Christians. This has nothing to do with possessions, whether it be money, anything. Possessions, you possess. The clothes you have on your back are possessions. This has nothing to do with that. This is all of the spiritual nature. You see, Jesus teaches the parable because it's a story. And when you learn it, when you hear it, the most world's most profound genius can listen to a parable and make some semblance of understanding of what he's probably saying. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, it doesn't matter. When you invest in your faith walk, when you read a parable at some point, it will click for you because what you have, more will be given to you. And that, my friends, is peace, knowledge, wisdom, contentment, understanding. That is something that no one can take away from you. You can lose all your stuff, just like Job, but no one can ever take away what God puts in you. Nothing can take that away. So quit reading this as like you're seeing something of, of, of worldly value. No, man. To the prisoner in prison who discovers that he was wrong and falls in love with Jesus, this is all he's got. To the poor person living under a bridge, this is all he's got. To those who are in a country where it's desolate, and Claire showed us the pictures a couple weeks ago, and sewage running in between your houses. You walk in your house and your sewage back, you, you, it stank and you're mad and you're calling your landlord. Or whoever can use a plunger in your house if you own it, is you the landlord at that point. You know, and we, we see them, they're walk, stepping over said sewage. And you see them and they're praising God. They welcome you in their home. They don't have much and they're happy to cook for you. You know, what is this, what is this life about? So let's, let's kind of look through this. I'm going to give you three basic points to the parable before I show you how to understand them going forward. But on this one, I want you to throw up, throw up verse 11, please. Or if you've got all three verses, if they won't fit up there, it's fine. We'll just leave 11. So, so it sounds like a parable in itself and how he answers it. But look at this. Uh, the parable has three purposes. One is to reveal truth. When speaking to the disciples, he said that 
uh, they had been given the keys to understanding the mysteries of the kingdom, right? But not everybody did. Basically, that means that whoever is seeking the kingdom of God, whoever is surrendering to Jesus Christ, those are the ones who are pursuing Christ, and those are the ones who are going to be able to really understand the message. Two, to conceal truth. Why is truth found in each parable um, hidden from so many people? Well, I told you, there are going to be the smartest people of the smartest people. But also, the Word of God tells us, Paul says, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. The smartest people will be mad at God. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how dumb you are. It doesn't matter how poor or rich you are. It doesn't matter your skin color or where you're from. On the east side of the tracks, on the west side of the tracks. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That is what life is all about. The third one is to fulfill prophecies about the Messiah. Jesus is the fulfillment of the the messianic promise. And when you read the parable, you see it. Look at this, John 10, 22. I'm gonna read 22 through 26. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bears witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. There are many human beings that just do not belong to him, never will. They'll never repent and believe. You know, it'll be our life's mission to try to get them to understand We'll, get, you know, we'll spend years going in our head. We've got to get them to accept Jesus Christ. And the, the cringeworthy one when, when uh, who's the billionaire that's trying to, just popped out of my head. The guy who was trying to buy Twitter. Thank Musk. Sounds like a cologne. But Elon Musk was on uh, uh, in the studio with some Christians. And, and one of them said, hey, do us a solid right here and accept Jesus as your savior. Yeah, because that's exactly how that works. You know, I accept the fact that my wife's lasagna is better than mine. That's hard for me to admit till I ate, and I didn't believe it till I ate it. David can make a pie better than me. True story. Worthy of a $100 bill when we had a dessert auction. Not from me, somebody else. I'm not paying that, but somebody else did. <laughs> Somebody else that had money. (laughs) That's awesome, but that's how good it is. People are like, 100 bucks, got it. I'm like, really? Then I had some. I'm like, holy moly, he's right. You can admit that some things are just easier to understand when you read them in Scripture, and this is one of them. God is doing something spectacular among people. Your job is to be a light, to evangelize. Your job is not to make somebody drink from the water in which you thought you led them to. You'll sometimes explain your testimony and you can see they're moved and all of a sudden then they're done. They're just, the, the story shuts off and you're like, I did I not do a good enough job. I feel like I should have done better. It's not up to you according to God. Look what he says in 27 through, 20, through 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And I read all that to you for that line right there. To get to that, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three in one. We teach a triune God here. Why? Because it's scriptural. There's God in three persons. All three co-equal, co-eternal, not three gods, one God. One God, three persons. Our brain can't get around that. Our brain can't wrap around that. What does that mean? I'm telling you what it says. You're not going to completely get it till you're with him or apart from him. And probably even then you'll never get it. With him, you'll completely get it. But that means that the three of them are all together in in agreement on everything. As I told somebody, somebody, uh, classically in argumentation, two things I want to say before I really get moving here. One is this. As a transforming Christian, you are made more like him. 
When you read the word and you pray, you become more like him, which means you love like he did. But by loving people doesn't mean that you change your threshold of toleration. Sin is still sin, and you have to abide by that understanding because this says it. And then every time somebody will say like, okay, but Jesus never talked about homosexuality. Yeah, he did. He referred to Levitical law. Let's explain something to you. Not only when we understand the triune God, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three in one, that means when God rained down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus was not only present, he was also in agreement. Amen? But when, when then people say, well, he didn't talk about it. doesn't matter. He didn't have to talk about everything because he did in the rest of the word. He's one with the Father and the Spirit. They wrote this through 40 authors over 1,500 years. Three continents, three different languages. This is the God we serve. Yeah, but we don't stand on the street corner with a stupid sign or sit here and say things out of anger and hatred because that's not what we do because we're being transformed by the true spirit of the living God. But that doesn't mean that we get lax on what sin is. Sin is sin. It's an offense to God. It needs to be atoned for, and that is why we have to teach it. Are people going to be in a sin situation and not changing it? Yeah. Your job is not to change them from it. Your job is to warn them by loving them through it, and they, if they draw near to God, they're going to be convicted enough, they're going to flee from that sin. They need to know that they can be forgiven and that their sin is an offense stained to God. In a story. I want to teach you how to understand the parables because I want you to pick up the Bible and read it for yourself. If you have a question for crying out loud, ask, and we'll help you. Okay? All right. Number one, look at the context. Context, context, context. The three rules of reading the Bible. Look at the context. When you're reading a story, know what it says. Parables, like all scripture, need to be interpreted in the context of the surrounding text. Ask yourself questions like, why did Jesus tell the story? Who was he talking to? Uh, what were the events that happened before, during, and after the story he's telling? Number two, determine what two things are being compared. Okay? When you're reading the uh, parable, parables usually compare an abstract spiritual concept like the kingdom of heaven to something physical. We have to understand that. Number three, consider the original audience. When you read a parable, think about this. So when you think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. John is a completely different gospel. Um, it is really what we call like the theological savvy book of the entire word of God. When we read the book of John, it's just, we are, those of us who are, who are Bible nerds and geeks read the book of John to this day, and we're still extracting stuff because we haven't quite got our head wrapped around everything that Jesus said, <laughs> you know, and John recorded. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, and they stand because they are all three very, very similar. But they have three different um, authors and three different audiences. Matthew was written to the Jewish people. That's why it opens up with the Jewish genealogy. Um, the uh, Book of Mark is the simplest one to read. It's really easy and practical, and that's why we always tell people who begin a Bible reading for the first time, we go, uh, read Mark. Read Mark and get started. Get your teeth uh, you know, ground on that one. And then the book of, of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. <laughs> Luke is actually um, uh, written by Luke, the Gentile author, the physician. So he has a very uh, secular audience that he writes to. So um, uh, to help the Gentiles understand who Christ was, and giving the backbone. So, you know, th this is the context, the original audience of each one, but when you read it, you can understand that. Number four, find the point. Parables usually have one main point. And so zoom in on the parable to try to understand its meaning. And you ask questions like, what happened at the end of the parable? And uh, who or what is the focus of the story? And these are the things that will really help you find the point. Who are the main characters of the story? Number five, make note of surprising details. I like doing that. When I'm reading through it, if there's something like the parable of the lost coin, I find it really interesting that she loses it in her house. That's not really losing it. That's misplacing it. Um, and then again, you know, when, you're, when you lose something and you stop looking for it when you find it, which is always funny because the person, when you find it, they think, why is it always in the last place I looked? Well, technically, because if you kept looking, you're a moron. So um, <laughs> just kidding. To tell that to one of my family members, and they would just glare at me. Um, but 
you know, she loses the coin and she celebrates. She has her friends come over and celebrate with her. The point is, this, that's just used as an example for Jesus to teach you what he's actually getting to. So look at the, make note of those, of those points, but don't get hung up on them. And that's what number six is. Don't get distracted by the details. Uh, while it's important to take note of what's going on in the parable, do not get bogged down by the tiny details that, you might, uh, that might make you miss the point, okay? Number seven, look in, for parallels in Scripture, this is something that we love to do. This is why a study Bible is really important because it'll help you draw. It'll show you where other parts of Scripture say the exact same thing, okay? So you want to look for par- parallels. Like um, you see the word king, master, uh, judge. In a parable, it's generally referring to who? God, amen? God is the master or the king or the ruler or whatnot. And similar, sheep, servants, um, workers are usually referred, referring to the followers of Christ. Uh, the book of Revelation, for instance, is much easier once you actually understand the parables, that's for sure. Eight, use commentaries. Um, this is why a study Bible is really important. Um, there are commentaries on every book of the Bible. Um, if you're not sure and you want to borrow one, we've got some, you could, we've got one you could borrow. Um, Got to give it back, but borrowing means taking it until you're done with it and you bring it back. Not you get to keep it and I'm going to forget you about it. Um, but you can keep it as long as you want. Or you can also, obviously, don't just Google everything. Ligonier, L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R, Ligonier, it was uh, R.C. Sproul's, um, founded by R.C. Sproul, his ministry. And they have done an amazing job, masterful job, uh, of confirmed commentaries on all forms of biblical theology. So you can a lot of times put like the parable of the lost coin, Ligonier, in your search bar. It'll pull it up and there's a one-page devotion. Wow, it takes you thir- 35 seconds to read it. So if you've read it and you're not sure, put that in with Ligonier and it'll usually pull you up a devotional. They're a great source. Number nine, that would be use discernment. This is the most important one. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you through your studies. That's not that hard, right? But pray, ask him, hey, Lord, I'm trying to read this and I'm getting confused and I want to not be confused. I know the enemy doesn't want me to read this because he doesn't want my life to change for the better. So I need you to help me through this. No problem. No problem at all for God to do that. You think he's going to misguide you? Not at all. Your human brain will. He won't. Number 10, I didn't add this, but I'm going to tell you now. Ask somebody. Ask somebody. If you're not too sure, it's okay to ask. So as we close, I want to I want to take you to this just one thing that I want to share with you this morning. Um, Luke ten. I'm gonna show you how to use all these. Adam, behold, in verse twenty five, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, "Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life?" He said to him, "What is written in the law? How do you read it?" And he answered, "You shall love the Lord God with all of your heart." with all of your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is called the great commandment. And the great commandment, you've heard me recite this before, um, this is really important, but watch this. He reads that and then goes to the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the parable of the Good Samaritan is built on this point. That's your context. So this is how we apply all nine. In verse 28, and he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, that is the um, lawyer, said to Jesus, and who was my neighbor? Grandstanding. Of course he would be. He's narcissistic. All human beings are, apart from God. Um, Verse 30, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed him, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, the Levite... When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, coins, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think, he's asking the lawyer, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? 
attorney says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and you do likewise. Now here's the outstanding part of the story. People hear a good Samaritan and you think what? Good person. He's a good Samaritan. We say it all the time, Samaritan's purse. Here's what happened, 722 BC. The nation of Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern, the northern territory is Israel. The southern one is Judea. Israel gets sacked in 722 BC, and they are dispersed. Judea holds strong for a while longer. Not Israel, not at first. So they all get dispersed, and all of the Jewish people from Israel decide to start intermarrying pagans. They are called Samaritans. They're half, Samar- half pagan, half Jewish. So the Jewish people, which we get the name from Judea, Judea, Jew, they don't like Samaritans because they cross race. This is why they wouldn't touch their land. And this is why Samaritans wouldn't touch their land. So isn't it funny how Jesus uses a Samaritan to the Jewish people to point his, get his point across? It doesn't matter what skin color you are, what side of the tracks you came from. It doesn't matter your, your, your monetary status. It doesn't matter who you are where you're from, what matters is that you repent and believe in Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And that's what should matter to you and I. And that's what should matter for the rest of our lives that we understand. It's not. That's why I hate the woke movement. That's why I hate this whole critical race theory. This is why. The last time I checked, when I was reading in Genesis, it says that we are all created by God in his own image. And you cut us, we all bleed the same blood. Twit div- the division of the church is coming from every angle now. Stop being divisive. That's divisive. Amen. The Meridans care for the Jew- injured Jewish man. And Jesus used this to show us something. There's a parallel found in Scripture and we can corroborate this by reading other passages that help us understand this, this step and this point that Jesus is teaching. Just as well, commentaries will help us do this. But more than anything else, we use discernment today. We use discernment today to read through that and understand that Jesus had a bigger picture to get to. And it's to quit denying those people um, uh, things. You know, you, you don't, only ask, don't ask the question, how, you know, w- when I pull up to a corner and there's a guy with a cardboard sign... How do I know he's okay to help? Ask the Spirit of God. Sometimes I pull up and I'm like, I'm not, I don't feel led to help them. You know what that usually means? It has nothing about their character. It's probably because they got a couple hundred bucks already. The other time I pull up and I looked at the dude, I'm like, had any luck today? And he goes, no. I'm like, are you hungry? He's like, I really am. Cool. You want a bottle of water too? Oh, dude, thank you. Packed his stuff up after I gave him what I gave him, and he walked away. And I know where he went. He went to the gas station right there. You know, don't fret. What are you judging for? Don't do that. Just pray about it. You know, but this, this is why the church has got to rise up and do this. You know, the world does it too. But don't ever let the world show you up, Christian. Don't let them be in the ones down at the soup line wondering where all the religious people are at. Go to the soup line because it's in you that you want to help them. We need people on Sunday nights helping at the mission. It's a blast. Who isn't blessed by going down there and serving? Always, every time I do it, I'm like, i got to come back sooner. Sundays are kind of a busy day for this guy, but I really love going down there and serving. And I've done it a few times. I'm so grateful that I was invited from my friends to do it. If you've not signed up, sign up. But there's lots of stuff to do. Lunch with Jesus. The doorstep always needs people helping down there. Go help them. How about this? Sign up for something here at the church. Start small. You know, bake for a funeral dinner. Clean windows. You know, something. Amen. 
That's what the church has got to do this. We, we do it together as a body. And then we go out in the world, we get better at it, and we go out there and we're like, we got to do this. We got to teach kids. All of a sudden, you got to teach kids, or you got to teach people in another place, or whatever the case is. Nobody's asking you to do something beyond your control or your comfort level. That's up to God. We're just preparing you for the training center. That's as every church should be. Do you understand atonement better? Thank you, David. Hope you understand parables better. Praise the Lord. Pray. Father, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Please bless us and redeem us every single day to live in you. For those who have not repented and believed, today is the day of salvation. And we pray, Lord God, that you would please open the door for our hearts to turn towards you. Today is the first day of the rest of our life. Tomorrow may never come. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you, Lord. I'm grateful that I get to baptize a special young lady next Sunday. And, and Lord God, if anybody feels uh, you know, called to do that, then we do that. We ask you, Lord Jesus, that you just continue to work through our lives in, in your merciless ways, in, uh, or merciful ways, Lord God. We're merc- merciless against you. We sin against you every single day. Please redeem us to live in you. Thank you for being merciful. We love you, Jesus. In your precious holy name we pray, amen.